not yet joining us. Okay, since we have a lot to cover today, uh, I'd like to call this meeting to order uh, with a uh, moment of silence, uh, remembering those that we've recently lost to gun violence and also uh, for those veterans who have paid the ultimate sacrifice. If you join me in a moment of silence. Thank you. Uh, so uh, <clears throat> what about, uh, Jeremy, can you confirm a quorum then? Yes, sir, we do have a quorum and uh, during the moment of silence, Katie Smith is recording and missing two members. Okay. And what about confirmation of press notice? Yes, sir, press has been notified. Okay. So we wanna welcome all of the board, appreciate you all attending this uh, meeting this is an important meeting we have a lot of ground to cover uh we're going to go uh if i'm going too fast slow me down if you have any questions uh please interrupt so uh the first item of business is consideration approval of the minutes of the board held april 28th uh 2022 i think everybody's had an opportunity to look at those if that's the case i would entertain a motion that we approve those minutes don't move this is chad Thank you, Chad. Do I have a second? Second. second. This is Gail. Okay. Sorry. I have, a, I have a motion to second. <laughs> All in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Oppose, like sign, motion carries. All right. Uh, so um, we have nine inducement resolutions, I think. So, Sam Thorner, you're going to be a busy guy. So, uh, the first inducement resolution is for the gateway on Broadway. So Sam, I'm gonna turn that over to you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So this item is for a second inducement resolution for the gateway on Broadway, which was formerly known as 1405 West Broadway Apartments. The gateway on Broadway Apartments project is requesting bonding authority in an amount not to exceed $25 million. This project involves the acquisition, construction, and rehabilitation of 116 units for elderly households located at 1405 West Broadway in Louisville. The project will serve 50 households at or below 30% area median income and 66 households at or below 50% area median income. Right. Of the 116 units, 112 will be one bedroom and four will be two bedroom. Right. Uh, the development team is available in the packet. As the financing for the project progresses, uh, the Board of Directors of Kentucky Housing Corporation must also authorize the issuance and sale of the taxes and bonds through the approval of a final resolution. KHC staff has reviewed the pre preliminary submittals of the applicant and recommends approval by the board of directors of an inducement resolution authorizing taxes and financing on the Gateway at Broadway project. Okay, any, any members have any questions of Sam? Okay, if, uh, if not, I will entertain a motion to uh, uh, adopt this uh, resolution. It's Kathy. I move. Thank you, Kathy. Do I have a second? It's Marilyn. I'll second. Okay. So we have a motion and a second. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, like sign. Motion carries. All right, Sam. So uh, the inducement resolution for uh, Garden Place. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So Garden Place Apartments Project is requesting bonding authority in an amount not to exceed $3.2 million. The project involves the acquisition and new construction of 30 units located at 100 Tyler Lane in Irvine, Kentucky. The project will serve nine elderly households <coughs> below 50% area median income, 21 elderly households at or below 60% AMI. Uh, 30 units will consist of 31 bedroom units. Uh, the development team is, is available in the packet um, as the financing for the project progresses, the Board of Directors must also authorize the issuance of sale of the tax exempt bonds through the approval of a final resolution. KHC staff has reviewed the preliminary submission of the applicant and recommends approval by the Board of Directors of an inducement resolution authorizing tax exempt financing for the Garden Place Apartments project. Okay. And this one is in Urban, Kentucky. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Any members have any questions of Sam? If not, I entertain a motion that we adopt this uh, resolution. 
I'll move. Okay, we have a Kathy. motion. We have a second. This is George. I'll second it. So we have a motion and a second. Uh, all in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed like sign. Um, motion carries. Okay, so uh, Sam, Oakdale Apartments. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So this is for a final resolution for Oakdale Apartments. The Oakdale Apartments project was granted an additional resolution on August 26, 2021 for a bonding authority in the amount of $15,930,000. Uh, final bond sale resolution was previously approved by the Kentucky Housing Corporation Board of Directors in the December meeting of last year. However, the final resolution included the requirement that the bonds be issued no later than April 30th, 2022. Unfortunately, the project has experienced delays due to market volatility and the development team is requesting that the bond issuance deadline be extended to December 30th of this year. All other terms and conditions will remain unchanged. This revised final resolution is for the same amount, $15,930,000. Um, they, uh, they had all the hearings and have been before the board and commissions that they need to. And the project uh, consists of 18 one bedroom units, 17, 72 two bedroom units and 54 three bedroom units. Oakdale Apartments is located at 1201 Greendale Road in Lexington, Kentucky. The development team is available in the packet and KHC staff uh, recommends approval by the board of directors of Kentucky Housing Corporation of this final resolution for the issuance of bonds for Oakdale Apartments. Do any, any members have any questions of Sam on this resolution? If not, uh, do I have a motion to adopt it? So moved, Mr. Chad. Thank you. Do I have a second? I'll second. It's Marilyn. Okay, so we have a motion and a second. All in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, like sign, motion carries. Okay, Sam, uh, Churchill Park. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So this is an inducement resolution for Churchill Park. The Churchill Park project is requesting bonding authority in an amount not to exceed $31 million. The project involves 248 units, including the acquisition and rehabilitation of 236 existing units and the new construction of 12 new units located in the vicinity of 2161 East 19th Street in Owensboro. The project will serve 248 households at or below 60% AMI. The 248 units will consist of 49 one-bedroom units, 112 two-bedroom units, 73 bedroom units, and 17 four-bedroom units. Uh, the development team is available to you on the screen. Um, as the financing for the project progresses, the Board of Directors must also authorize the issuance and sale of the tax exempt bonds through an approval of a separate final resolution. KHC staff has reviewed the preliminary submission of the applicant and recommends approval by the Board of Directors of an inducement resolution authorizing the tax exempt financing for the Churchill Park project. Okay, any members have any questions of Sam uh, on this resolution? So, uh, do I have a motion that we adopt this inducement resolution? Kathy, I move. I love four bedroom and three bedroom apartments. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy. Do I have a second? Second. 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 Okay. So, we have a motion and a second. Uh, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, like sign. Motion <clears throat> carries. Okay, Sam, you're a busy man today. Path off King Run. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So this is an inducement resolution for the Path off King Run. Um, that project is requesting bonding authority in an amount not to exceed $17.5 million. The project involves new construction of 106 units located at various addresses on King Run Road in Louisville. The project will serve 106 households at or below 60% area median income. Uh, this project will consist of 78 three bedroom units and 28 four bedroom units. As the project for the as the financing for the project progresses, the board of directors uh, must also authorize the issuance and sale of tax exempt bonds through the approval of a separate resolution. <coughs> the staff has reviewed the preliminary submission of the applicant and recommends approval by the board of directors of Kentucky Housing Corporation of an inducement resolution authorizing the tax exempt financing for the path off can run project. Okay, any members have any questions about this project? If not, I'll entertain a motion that we adopt this inducement resolution. Kathy, I move, same comment as before. Thank you, Kathy. Do I have a second? 
Holly, I'll say. Okay, thank you, Holly. <clears throat> uh, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, like sign, motion carries. Okay, Sam uh, Richwood Bend. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So this is an inducement resolution for which Richwood Bend. The Richwood project is requesting bonding authority in an amount not to exceed $10 million. It involves the acquisition and new construction of 84 units at 100, 100 Cottell Drive in Fayette County, Kentucky. The project will serve um, one household at or below 50% area median income and 83 households at or below 60% area median income. The 84 units will consist of 24 one-bedroom units, 24 two-bedroom units, and 36 three-bedroom units. The development team is available on your screen. Um, as the financing for the project progresses, the Board of Directors of Kentucky Housing Corp Corporation must also authorize the issuance and sale of the tax exempt bonds through the approval of a separate final resolution. KHC staff has reviewed the preliminary submission of the applicant and recommends approval by the Board of Directors of an inducement resolution authorizing taxes and financing for this project. Okay, any members have any questions? All right, if not, I'll entertain a motion. We adopt this resolution. This so is George. Okay, have a motion. Do I have a second? <clears throat> is that a second? I'll second. I'll second. Thank you. Uh, so we have a motion and second. All in favor signify by saying aye. Mr. Aye. Chairman, I'm sorry uh, to interrupt. Uh, Mr. C made a motion and seconded his motion. We need a, someone else to make a second, please. Okay. I can second that. Oh, I thought somebody else made the motion. I'm sorry. Okay. Mr. Chair, I'll second it. All right. So we we square, Jeremy. Yes, sir. Thank you. Sorry for the confusion. That's all right. Okay. Uh, uh, all in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, like sign. Motion carries. Okay. So Winterwood Portfolio Three. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This is for an inducement resolution for the Winterwood Portfolio Three. So this project is requesting bonding authority in an amount not to exceed $12 million. It involves the acquisition and rehabilitation of six existing apartment complexes scattered across uh, Kentucky for a total of 20, 221 units. The project will serve 15 households at or below 50% AMI and 206 households at or below 60% AMI. Uh, the 221 units across all uh, buildings will consist of 118 one-bedroom units, 82 bedroom units, and 23 three-bedroom units. Uh, and the units, uh, for your information, will be located in Jessamine, Mercer, Spencer, Clinton, and Powell counties. The development team is uh, available on your screen. And as the financing progresses, the Board of Directors of Kentucky Housing Corporation must also authorize the issuance and sale of the tax exempt bonds through a separate uh, final resolution. So KHC staff has reviewed the preliminary submission of the applicant and recommends approval by the Board of Directors of an inducement resolution authorizing the tax exempt financing for this project. Got any members have any questions to Sam on this project or these projects? Uh, if, if not, I'll entertain a motion to adopt this resolution. So moved, Gail. Do I have a motion? Uh, do I have a second? I'll second. All right, thank you. So we have a motion, second. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, aye. like sign. Motion carries. Okay, so Sam, uh, <clears throat> so we're down to Bowling Green Tires, is that right? Um, we, we have two more, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> this is for a final resolution for Bowling Green Towers. Um, Bowling Green Towers is a project that was granted inducement resolution in April of last year for bonding authority in the amount not to exceed $22,500,000. Uh, this final resolution is for the same amount. The project involves the acquisition and rehabilitation of 202 units serving the elderly at or below 60% area median income. Uh, the project consists of 201 one-bedroom apartments and one two-bedroom apartment. Bowling Green Towers is located at 1149 College Street in Bowling Green. The development team is shown on your screen and KHC staff recommends approval by the Board of Directors of Kentucky Housing Corporation of this final resolution for the issuance of bonds for Bowling Green Towers. Any members have any questions of Sam on this resolution? Not only entertain a motion, we adopt it. Okay, we have a motion. Do we have a second? 
Somebody? Uh, Mr. Barry, I'll second. Thank you. Okay, so we have a motion and a second. <clears throat> All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, like sign. Motion carries. Okay, so the Carl Perkins Apartments in Pikeville. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So this is for a final resolution for the Carl D. Perkins Apartments project. And this project was granted an inducement resolution in August of last year for bonding authority in the amount not to exceed $10 million. Its final resolution is for the same amount. The project involves the acquisition and rehabilitation of 150 units serving the elderly at or below 60% area median income. The project consists of 151 bedroom units and it's located at 200 Douglas Parkway in Pikeville, Kentucky. Um, the development team is available on your screen and KHC staff recommends approval by the board of directors of this final resolution for the issuance of bonds for this project. Okay, we have a motion to adopt this resolution. So moved, Gail. Okay, thank you, Gail. Second? This is George, I'll second it. Okay, thanks, George. Uh, all in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Uh, aye. Opposed, like sign, motion carries. So, uh, Sam, we appreciate your, your hard work. You uh, Looks like you've been really busy. Yes, sir, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And that's uh, <coughs> a really good job on your part. So, thank you. Thank you. All right. So moving right along, we fiscal year 2023 corporate planning. Uh, so we have a presentation of overarching strategies uh, by Gail Lively and John Davidson. So uh, I'm going to turn it over to you folks to go right ahead with this. Thank you and welcome everybody. On Thursday, May the 19th, a joint policy and programs committee and communication and planning was held virtually at 12.30 p.m. During that meeting, the y, FY23 overarching strategies were presented as well as the FY20 fiscal year 23 allocation plan. John Davidson is going to present the FY23 overarching strategies. John? Thank you, Gail. <laughs> Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. I'm John Davidson, the Deputy Executive Director of Business Services. And today I'm going to present the Fiscal 23 Overarching Strategies. This is an informational item only and does not require any action on behalf of the board. Before I dive into these strategies, I wanted to provide some brief context and background about our planning process. Early in the year in January, our finance area, led by Jim Statler, does a cost revenue analysis and analyzes the cost of our operations, attributing overhead and comparing um, revenue to that. Then in February and March, we develop strategies and business planning scorecards for every area of the corporation in which we establish overarching strategic direction and specific goals for the department and each uh, department to carry out. In April, the allocation planning process begins in which we determine how financial resources are going to be invested. And you're gonna hear about that in a little while. And then in May, um, the operating budget, a balanced budget is presented. You'll hear about that a little bit later as well. And as Gail mentioned, um, all of these documents are um, presented to various committees of the board in advance of the May board meeting in which um, we ask for approval. And then last but not least, we report on these um, and track these semi-annually to the board. So with that being said, I wanted to give you a little bit of background before we talk about the three strategies, which are our fiscal 23 corporate strategies. First, is providing holistic housing solutions. Well, what does that mean and how are we going to do it? 1A is operate and align existing programs proficiently in collaboration with partners across the state. We do that through our allocation planning process, which you're going to hear about, as well as we track the units produced, mortgage loans originated and serviced, all the special populations that we um, serve with the myriad of programs that we operate. And all of this could not be done without collaboration and partnership with various entities 
um, and partner agencies across the state. B, 1B is implement and administer COVID relief programs effectively. Since December of 2020, the corporation and or the Commonwealth of Kentucky has received over $655 million in COVID relief funds. So we have been very busy um, administering those desperately needed and uh, programs to help Kentuckians. 1C is utilizing data and analytics to shape policy and decision making. I'll give you an example of how we do that using a data visualization tool called Tableau. And in December of last year, when the tornadoes hit Western Kentucky, ta a Tableau visualization was created to provide available units that people could access and view and see um, who might need housing. That visualization has been viewed over 5,000 times. Um, 1D, identify and evaluate limiting factors to our, of our programs. We're going to continue to evaluate financial, regulatory and programmatic factors that might be limiting factors for some of the programs that we administer. So I'm going to um, pause there and, and move to the next item uh, strategy, which is being flexible and responding to financial risk and how and what that means. You'll see 2A, mitigate impact of COVID-19 on our legacy housing programs and lending programs. So as I mentioned earlier, um, while we have received all the new COVID funding, it is still imperative that we maintain the stability of our core lines of business, uh -huh. our single family loan volume, secondary market trade gains, tenant assistant programs, multifamily development and units produced. So we operate all of those in addition to the COVID relief programs. Um, 2C is optimize and utilize available administrative fees. So we receive an administrative fee for many of the programs and grants we operate federally. Um, and we want to make sure that we are realizing, recouping and utilizing those administrative fees as efficiently as possible, both on a dollars, but also on a percentage basis. 2C, evaluate opportunities to systematically deploy, deploy financial resources to support the mission. Again, you're going you're gonna to hear about that in just a second um, from Wendy about the allocation funding. And our mission is to invest in quality housing solutions for families across the Commonwealth of Kentucky. 2D, maintain prudent stewardship of financial resources and effective risk management. We do that in various ways. We have rating agency standards, we have HUD standards, we have key financial metrics, all of which aid in the amount of assistance and the amount of reimbursement, the amount, um, how far our dollars go. And it is important that we continue and main sh make sure that we are being prudent um, of the financial resource resources that we are, we are responsible for, for overseeing to help as many Kentuckians as possible. Last but not least is three, sustaining and advancing core competencies. You will see 3A there, develop processes and technology to ensure business continuity. Well, how do we do that? We have a co-location site, system and network availability and redundancy to minimize business disruption so that we can carry out the work um, that the corporation does. 3B, expanding workforce development efforts to retain, promote and recruit exceptional talent at all level at all levels. So we are expanding our candidate pools, whether that is temp to perm uh, employees. We are we are looking at our recruitment efforts and, and spreading a wide net, I like to say. We are doing we have engaged in employee engagement surveys and are taking that feedback to um, to heart and and looking to make enhancements and um, and, and address additional efficiencies. Internship programs really looking at other ways and expanded ways to, um, to, to develop our workforce so that we can not only retain the people we have, but also recruit the talent that is necessary to continue to operate our programs proficiently. 
Three C, invest in technology to drive efficiency and innovation in a flexible work environment. So we invest, we have invested, I should say, in technology to support a hybrid work environment. Um, a lot of our staff work remotely um, and or hybridly and are uh, working remote and in the office. We're also looking to take several of our applications to the cloud and be cloud-based, virtual desktops and several other initiatives to be a very flexible, responsive work environment um, for employees to uh, be able to utilize. And last but not least um, is 3D, which is our advancement of diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts, specifically as it relates to continuing education and imp implementation of our DEI practices and principles. Um, this Tuesday concluded our uh, last DEI training okay. where all of our staff at the corporation uh, attended um, DEI training and uh, by an outside vendor and the feedback was excellent on that. In addition, um, we are monitoring the minority representation and participation in our workforce and across programs. So I shared um, in February that we experienced the highest percentage of minority uh, representation um, for Kentucky Housing Corporation um, since, since I've been in this role and certainly since I can remember. Um, and we are also looking at the female uh, participation in our workforce as well as several other EEOC um, components that that we're looking at with our and responsible for tracking with our workforce, as well as our programs, looking at some of the voluntary uh, demographic information that is either collected uh, or supplied. Um, diversity and contractor diversity is very important. Um, so uh, we have in our procurement process and uh, processes, whether it's small contract procurement or RFP processes, we award um, to women and minority business entities um, additional points. Uh, we also reach out to uh, women and minority business um, entities when uh, there is an opportunity to bid on work and or um, uh, perform some services for the corporation. And last but not least, um, we are tracking and reporting these DEI um, components and metrics um, at, on a quarterly basis and semi-annually to the board. All of this is done and tracked using scorecards, which each department is responsible for. Um, and we look at those as an executive team uh, quarterly. And again, um, in, um, we report those in February and August to the board. So with that, I'm gonna conclude my, my comments and presentation, uh, but hopefully you see that um, all the, the information that is presented after this, the allocation plan and the budget uh, tie to these strategies. So with that, um, that concludes my comments and I will uh, entertain any questions should there, should there be any, but thank you for your time today. John, that's extremely well done. And uh, we appreciate your 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 work on that, Gail. Do you have any qu any comments you want to make? Uh, Not at all. I just want to compliment John. He's done a wonderful job, as well as the committee members in preparing this. And he's he's been super super. So congratulations to John. Thank you, Gail, and okay. your committee, and John. Thank you so much for your hard work. So, do any any members have any questions of John? Okay, if not, uh, Jeremy or Winston, do we need a motion to adopt this? No, no we don't. Informational only. Okay, all right. Okay, well, John, uh, we appreciate your effort and this is uh, extremely well done. So thank you very much. Thank you all very much. Okay, so uh, <clears throat> we need to adopt uh, the Kentucky Housing Corporation uh, annual allocation plan. And Barry, uh, I know you and Wendy have been working on this in your committee, so I'm going to turn it over to you at this point. Absolutely. Well, Wendy has done a fabulous job as well as John, and we had a had a wonderful as as uh, Gail was pointing out a great joint policy and communication committee meeting the, on May 19th. Uh, Wendy went over our 
uh, portion of from the program and policy committee, the adoption of the Kentucky fiscal year 23 annual allocation plan. So unlike John's, it's a little more boring because we get a lot more numbers, but <laughs> Wendy makes it very entertaining so and enlightening. So I'll let Wendy uh, start with the presentation. I take great offense to that, Barry. I think the numbers are really exciting. <laughs> I like <It> pictures. <laughs> <laughs> I'll remember that next year. Um, good afternoon, everybody. So this, again, as John uh, framed up for you, we have this um, annual planning process that we go through that involves several components at KHC. John presented our overarching strategies. And now what I'm presenting is our allocation plan. Later, Jim Statler will talk about our operating budget. While the operating budget um, shares with you all the numbers about how we're going to pay for our operations to get the work done, this allocation plan that you're looking at is about the investments, allocations, grant funding, financing that we will be making across the Commonwealth in fiscal year 23. It is a projection. It's impossible to know what the exact numbers are going to be really until the fiscal year closes. Um, but we do this each year to sort of have a sense of what funds are coming into KHC, what funds will be going out to partners, to uh, projects, to home, home buyers, all that kind of stuff. And to be able to give you all as the board a sense of how we are allocating our funds across the different uses, the different missional activities that we do. Um, it is important to know that for many of these funding sources, it's really prescriptive in terms of how we can use the dollars. You can't move it between different programmatic categories. There are a few that um, do fall across multiple categories because there is a little bit of discretion about how we use them, but most of them kind of have to be used the, the way and, and for the use that we're using them. Um, the other thing I want to share is you all actually have three tables in the PDF uh, board packet. And they all represent the same numbers. So one is kind of the chart of the sources of the funds. One is a chart of the uses of those funds. And then what we're looking at, at right now is kind of this high level roll up that we call the impact uh, worksheet, which means it's our way of trying to roll the numbers up and give the board a sense of what's the impact projected to be across the Commonwealth uh, for the investments that we're, we're planning to make. So again, I want to make sure you all know, I'm not going to present all three worksheets. They are the same numbers, just organized kind of in different ways in case you're wanting to look at uh, the categories of money coming in or the categories of how the money goes out. And then this one is the, the impact. How many households or units do we plan to assist in the next fiscal year? So again, we went through this in great detail with the committee last week. I'm just going to give you all kind of some high level notable um, items on the allocation plan. So if we start with single family lending, this is our, our programs where we make home loans to first time and low income home buyers across the state. Um, what you'll notice is we are projecting a slight uptick in the dollar amount for single family loans, but a downtick in the number of households getting those loans. And that's largely because we expect the um, loan per household to go up because housing costs are going up. Um, I will also note that you will see a significant uptick in the amount we are committing to down payment assistance. Last fiscal year, or the one we're in right now, we allocated around 16 million. We're projecting 25 million next fiscal year. Um, we're paying for this out of discretionary funds that KHC has where when we make money, we invest that in what we call the home, the, the housing assistance fund, the HAF, and we use that largely for down payment assistance. And what's notable is, is that we have raised our maximum down payment assistance to $7,500 to help more homeowners with their purchase power because costs are going up and we hope that this will allow us to reach a wider range of home buyers across the, across the Commonwealth. Um, the other notable addition that did not show up on last year's allocation plan for single family programs is the homeowner assistance fund. And this is a COVID-19, you know, one-time bucket of funding um, that we can use to help home buyers who got behind on their mortgage during the pandemic. The total funding was about 85 million. 
we are just projecting a kind of a modest amount, about 9 million, because we just don't know how many homeowners are going to take us up on that. A lot of variables at play in that, but we're projecting about 650 homeowners and about $9 million. Um, moving on down to homeownership production, this is a program area where we fund nonprofits. Sometimes it's Habitat for Humanity or other community development organizations to build houses or repair homes for existing homeowners. We expect to have a little more money in this, about $1.8 million more. Um, but not to help a, a, a lot more households. Uh, actually, we, we've kept the number even. And that, again, is because the cost of construction for repairs or for building houses is going up. And we think it's going to take a little more money to help about the same number of, of homeowners and home buyers. Um, multifamily production, we have a decrease in funds. That is largely because our tax credit equity has gone down a little bit. And our available bonds for multifamily have gone down. And you will note then also that our cost per unit is expected to be slightly higher. So the number of units we're projecting to fund or finance has gone down. Not radically, but it has gone down. As costs go up, that does impact our ability to, you know, to get more units to market and to assist more households across the Commonwealth. The next category is our rent assistance program. So this is um, Section 8 vouchers, project-based Section 8. That's that first uh, row where it says families benefiting from rent subsidized units. Um, we anticipate this going up just a little bit in part because the amount per household is going up. Rents are ticking up and HUD does allow us to increase the rent that we're paying on behalf of tenants. Um, and we will assist every year, we're projecting to assist about 27,000 households with rent assistance across the, across the state. Um, you will also note that last um, row uh, where we have COVID-19 eviction relief funds, that is our uh, Healthy at Home Eviction Relief Program. Again, that's one-time COVID funding, but it's a significant amount of funding um, we were projecting in this current fiscal year to get about $125 million out to eclipse that. We are projecting even more in the next fiscal year to go out in, in rent assistance. This is for folks who are in eviction court, who are behind on their rent and need, they don't get ongoing forever and ever rent assistance. It's a one-time amount of help to get them caught up. And we added Jefferson County at the beginning of May. They're out of these funds. They got some emergency rental assistance funds to the Treasury. Louisville is out of their funds, so we added Jefferson County to our service area, so we expect to use even more dollars in the next fiscal year, which is a good thing. It's just going to be good for the state and for Jefferson County. And then when you look at our homeless and special needs programs, um, what we've got with our first category is our regular year-over-year -year homeless programs rolled up. And you will see that that funding is about steady compared to last year, about $8.5 million. But because we expect to spend more per household, our number of households is expected to go down. And that's largely because the cost of helping people um, get leased up and pay for their rent, which many of these programs can do, it's just getting more expensive. Um, and then that last row, you will see on there emergency solutions grant funding through the CARES Act. We have a number of households on there, but no dollar amount. And here's why. We have allocated all of those funds to partners, but they have several years to use them. And so we don't show a dollar amount, but we do still expect around 3,500 households to get assistance with getting out of homelessness or preventing homelessness with those dollars. And then our, our last category is our uh, weatherization programs. And these are programs that help low-income homeowners reduce their utility bills by way of energy efficiency improvements to their homes, weatherization and other energy efficiency improvements. And so what you will note is that we kind of have a, a slight reduction in our year over year um, funding. We got about 3.2 million last year. We're projecting 11.6 million in our regular programs, but the bipartisan infrastructure bill um, offered a one-time increase of actually $50 million um, in weatherization. We are projecting to try to get about half of that allocated next fiscal year with the idea that the rest of it will get allocated in future fiscal years. We have um, 
We have five years to use this money with the option of potentially renewing for another five. So we have a little bit of time. And that will significantly increase the number of households that we can help. And this can make, this is probably one of the fastest, lowest cost ways for us to get more money in low income households pockets. If they're not paying as much for utilities, they have more money for childcare, for uh, groceries, for prescriptions, all that kind of stuff. So, and Jeremy, if you'll scroll on just a tiny bit so we can see that roll up number, you will see that the all in number is almost $1.4 billion, um, slightly higher than last year. And again, last year we had a lot of one-time COVID money as well. So um, not, not totally different, but again, both last fiscal year and this one are showing a lot of one-time money that eventually will, will go away and won't, won't likely get renewed. Um, but with that, um, I will entertain any questions and invite the board to consider uh, the resolution to approve our allocation plan. So uh, Wendy, thank you so much. Uh, I'm always amazed at uh, the work you all do and and the efficiency by which you do it and uh, the impact that you have on on the state of Kentucky is 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 just absolutely enormous. Uh, so uh, Barry and Wendy, I appreciate your all's hard work and I appreciate the work of the committee. Uh, Barry, do you have anything you want to add to Wendy's comments? Okay. Uh, do any members have any questions of Wendy? Uh, that they would they like to ask or a Barry? I'm sorry, I was on mute. I was, I'm sorry, Mr. Chairman. Um, I do want to talk about Wednesdays and her staff just a, a second because this was a lot of hard work uh, to put all this together. And I do have to to say that she did paint a good, great picture by painting by the numbers. So, but she did a fabulous job. And this is the to put all the pieces together by the numbers and allocate the, the numbers. It's not a hard, not an easy job. Trust me, I do this by on my own own uh, day job, and she's done a fabulous job. Yeah. Well, we we appreciate the job everybody's done on this. It, it is amazing. Uh, Wendy, I do have one question: the unemployment bridge program. Uh, yes, sir. You have a zero, and tell me again why why is that the case? Yes, so that is a program from the um, 08 uh, mortgage crisis. Um, it's okay. much like our homeowner assistance fund. It, it, so that's from 08 and it just sunset recently. We just finally wound that down while we started up the homeowner assistance fund. They're not identical, but very similar programs, but we are no longer utilizing that, those funds. Okay, so, there, so there's help for those folks in, in other programs you have, right? Yes, sir, yeah. Okay, okay. Okay, any other members, any other questions or comments? It's amazing work. So if there are no other questions or comments, I'd entertain a motion that we adopt this resolution 36 uh, for this allocation plan. I make a motion. I'll make that motion. Second. I'll second. All right. Uh, all in favor signify by saying aye. Uh, aye. aye. Opposed like sign, uh, motion carries. Okay, thank you, Wendy, and thank you, Barry. All right, uh, so uh, Steve, I'm gonna turn the next one over to you to report uh, of action recommendations to the Finance Committee. Uh, so you wanna take it from here? Uh, Mr. Je Mr. Chairman, this is Jim Statler. Um, Mr. Brunson was called to a meeting in Atlanta at the last minute, is not here today. So I'm going to uh, MC the program for this piece, if, if, if I may. Yeah, absolutely. Go right ahead, Jim. Uh, All right. The Finance Committee of the Kentucky Housing Corporation Board of Directors met virtually at 2 o'clock p.m. on Thursday, May 19 of 2022. We covered three main items on the agenda, each of which will get a little bit of airtime today. And I'll start off with Kevin Field, internal auditor, who led off the meeting with a presentation for recommended approval of the fiscal 2023 annual internal audit plan. At this time, I ask Kevin to present the highlights of that plan. Thank you, Jim. Uh, Mr. Chairman and members of the board, uh, agenda item number 13A concerns a recommendation for the approval of the annual internal audit plan for fiscal year 2023. So auditing standards require that a risk-based audit plan be developed each year to determine the priorities of the internal audit function in a manner that is consistent with the organization's goals. 
So the plan itself is designed to provide the board and management with a summary regarding the audit services, which are planned to be performed during the upcoming fiscal year. The planned audit projects include operational uh, programmatic reviews, quality assurance reviews, uh, as well as an external audit support and advisory services. So it, within the plan, um, there's a summary of these audit activities, which are outlined on pages five through seven. Those are the ones that um, are incorporated in fiscal year 2023's plan. Um, and then there's also a summary of the completed audit projects from this current fiscal year uh, 2022 outlined on pages nine and 10. So although much of the work that internal audit performs um, is regulatory in nature, uh, it's performed based upon the requirements of those regulations. The, the plan itself remains a flexible document. It's basically intended to try to optimize audit coverage uh, to the best extent possible. But with that in mind, the audit department is always available to address any concerns of board or senior management. I, I would be happy to answer any questions you may have. Uh, otherwise, for your consideration, is the audit plan for 50 years. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, and I and I've uh, looked over this this morning, and uh, it's a, it's an excellent audit plan. Uh, I'm really impressed with the work you've done here. So it's excellent work. And uh, do any members have any questions of of Kevin in regard to this audit plan? Yeah. Yeah. If not, I'll entertain a motion that we adopt uh, this audit plan. I make a motion. Okay, we have a motion. Do I have a second? Second, Mary. We have a motion and a second. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Motion carries. Uh, Kevin, thank you very much. Appreciate thank your you. hard work on this. Thank you. So, Jim, that leads us to the uh, financial update. Yes, sir. The second agenda item at the committee meeting last Thursday was a presentation of the corporation's third quarter results. And I'm prepared to give you a very brief recap of that uh, uh, in ju just now. Uh, this is an informational presentation and will not require full board action. If you go to and look at what's on your screen now, uh, draw your attention to line B, which is uh, cash and investments. And you'll see a significant drop in that line from June of last uh, summer to March of this year. Uh, that represents the fact that we have paid the pension off and, and wrote two checks or sent two wires totaling $88 million across the street. Uh, and got out of the uh, KERS pension plan. Uh, you can visually see that also on line H where the liability for $90 million at the end of June is now zero. Uh, I said $86 million, I think, in a, a moment ago. It actually was uh, $4 million less uh, expensive to get out than we had estimated using uh, very gray numbers, if you will, back in June to set the liability in the first place. So. Um, it was, uh, 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 I think, a huge achievement uh, to be able to pay that off and, and set the stage for a much more nimble and, and uh, reactive uh, labor force and, and way of managing our business. Uh, the other two items on, on this schedule, and, and I, had a, I had a caption up here that uh, the, the third quarter statements were, were, there's no surprises in them, but there is a little bit of disappointment. and and. Uh, if you look at line N, this is not disappointing. We actually have been able to grow the portfolio, uh, which is service for others. It's not on the balance sheet, but it generates a large, large amount of fee income uh, nonetheless. And we've been able to grow it just by 1%. The disappointing piece of that is the portfolio we, we replaced generated uh, a higher service fee rate than the, ser than the servicing we replaced it with. And so the average servicing fee dropped from 33.1 basis points to 31.3 basis points or 1.8 basis point drop. In dollars on the size of a portfolio we have, the earnings potential of the new portfolio or the portfolio at March 31st will generate about 400 to $450,000 less service fee revenue than the, than the portfolio of an equal size would have uh, generated at, at June 30th. Not monstrous, but we always like to see that number go up a little bit. Uh, some of that is a function of how we trade uh, our loans 
and how much servicing fee we generate when we do that. So uh, it's not a surprise. We knew we were doing it. Uh, it's just disappointing that we showed a little bit of a drop there. Looking forward to the fourth quarter, I anticipate that going up maybe a tenth of a BIP uh, as we are now selling selling loans to generate a higher servicing fee and, and uh, less cash gain uh, coming off the table. If we can go to the next statement, please, Jeremy, thank you. Um, a little disappointing here as well, line D, I'm gonna draw your attention to. Uh, these are the gains on sale of loans, net of lender compensation. We had $31 million for the first three months or the first nine months of fiscal 21 in secondary marketing gains. That is almost cut in half or cut in, cut in uh, by a little bit more than half uh, down to $15 million for the first nine months of fiscal 22. And those of you who've been on the board recall that, that you know, 12, 15, 18 months ago, I, I couldn't explain why we were getting such great prices for our loans. And uh, the, I guess the market caught up to it and, and said, we shouldn't be paying that much. And, and they're not. That's a, a, a function primarily though of, of prepayment speeds, uh, experience of how, how the pools nationwide, not just ours, are prepaying and causing the premiums that had been paid uh, to, be, to be realized to be unrealistic. Second, as rates go up, future prepayment or anticipated prepayments of those securities uh, goes up as well. And, and the theory is, is that the earn back of the premium is over a shorter period of time, therefore the premium has to be reduced. So uh, that's the new reality, uh, the, the, the interest rates environment now, uh, there's huge, huge com uh, convexity in the pricing of, of the securities as they go up in interest rates. Uh, and that's reflective of the anticipated higher prepayment speeds that are gonna be experienced on those. And so the, the, the great times of the gains from a year and a half, two years ago are, are really much more normal, if you will, uh, to the way uh, gains have historically been uh, in the in the MBS markets. Again, not a surprise, but disappointing. I would have liked to have that extra $15 million uh, in our bottom line. Uh, line F, uh, another phenomenon of rising interest rates is that we have a decrease in the value of our securities. Rates go up, 4% securities aren't worth as much as they were. We're required to write those down to, to current market value. That costs us uh, uh, in fiscal 22, $8,500,000 uh, in fiscal uh, or through March of 21, that only hurt us by $2 million. That only hurts us if we sell the securities at this lower cost and realize the loss. But we must recognize the loss when, when, we, uh, uh, when the value of the securities changes. So uh, if we hold these securities to maturity, we're going to pick up all that eight, eight and a half million dollars back. And so we have no intention of selling into this market. And so as rates go down, as, as rates always will, eventually uh, the value of those securities will go up or as they get closer to maturity, they'll amortize uh, up to about par. And so uh, it's, a, it's an ugly number on the statements, but it's not one that's actually going to result in, in, a rec in a realized loss. Uh, the other uh, item of note on this call, on the schedule is uh, uh, row H. You'll see a tremendous drop in G&A expense from $17.8 million to 10.2, uh, nine months versus nine months. That is the value of having executed, exited the pension plan. Uh, we went from paying 49% of our, of our compensation uh, in the way of pension uh, premiums down to 4%. And so that realization uh, shows up in the financial statements on the G&A line, and uh, we'll be benefiting from that decision and that execution for many years to come. Uh, going to the next schedule, if we can, and uh, this is the cash flow statement, the kind of a complex statement for, for it. You'd think it'd be easier, just count the cash in, count the cash out, but it's uh, a little more complex than that. Uh, line B is the relevant line here. You can see that the cash flows uh, for the for uh, non-capital financing activities, uh, the outflows were $151 million for the three month or the nine months ended March of 22. The nine months ended March of 21, it was only $55 million. That's about how much the pension cost us. And so again, no surprises here. We spent $90 million of cash, and this is where it shows up on the cash flow statement. Uh, next page. Uh, this is where we're loading some comparison of budget versus actual. We've got income on this schedule, a uh, one line representing operating expenses on row on row O, but uh, and that's covered in the next page. But you can see I'm looking in the second from the right column, favorable, unfavorable dollar variance. We have positive variances on line A, C, and E. This is where we under budgeted uh, the basically the COVID initiatives that we've been involved with in the last 18 months 
Uh, we had very little track record to go on on estimating last year, if, we, if you recall, when we presented the budget. And we have uh, uh, generated much more income, uh, admin fees, if you will, from those three activities than we had budgeted. We also had underestimated the cost of operating those. And so the favorable variance on the income side uh, is reflected as an unfavorable variance on the expense side, which we'll cover in just a second. Uh, one other item of note, rental production shows a positive variance. Is, this is line H uh, of a million dollars budget versus actual. Some of that will be paid back in the fourth quarter as there is a, uh, uh, the third quarter is a, is a very high revenue month uh, and uh, followed by a lower revenue month in the fourth quarter. So some of that variance will be given back. We're not gonna give back any dollars. We're gonna give back the, the variance of, of the dollars that we do have for year to date versus the year to date uh, budgeted dollars. So overall, if you look down in line N, $5.9 million uh, uh, positive variance on revenue at line O, a $2.4 million negative variance on expenses for uh, overall performance, three and a half million dollars favorable to budget uh, for the first nine months of the year. And we can go to the next page to talk a little bit about the operating expenses. Uh, the, the big item here, you can look at, 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 at payroll. Uh, it's our, obviously our biggest expense item. And boy, we nailed it, $145,000 is, 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 uh, is the variance on this. One caveat, that much of that variance is gonna give, be given back in, in, in June primarily because of the way we accrue and pay our payrolls. And so we're gonna finish the year uh, maybe seven hundred to eight hundred thousand dollars negative to 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 uh, uh, budget again. Not a surprise. We under budgeted the activity in HHERF and a couple of the other COVID initiatives. We've had to hire a lot of people to, to handle that, and therefore uh, a negative variance in in payroll to finish off the year uh, should be expected and 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 not a surprise. Uh, similarly, if you look at business services line E, uh, we had no idea that we'd have to hire so many people from outside to. To, to manage the HHERF program. We had budgeted $747,000 for the first nine months, and we've incurred $4.3 million. And so there's a huge negative variance, more than offset by the huge positive variance that we just talked about on the income side. So again, more revenue, more expense, more expense, more revenue, everything makes sense. It's just that we under budgeted the overall level of activity in the, in the COVID initiative uh, uh, programs. Then if you look at the rest of the expenses, uh, many of those are six digit positives. And if you recall last year when we set the budget, we thought the pandemic was over a year ago. And so we were going to resume uh, foreclosure activity as loans would come off of forbearance. We would resume occupying the offices uh, um, and, and, and incur occupancy expense. We would resume employee training and employee development, much of which takes place offsite and none of that happened during fiscal has not hasn't happened yet in fiscal 22 uh, because the pandemic has has uh, stuck around a little bit. And so we anticipated spending it and when we set the budget last year, we have not spent it. Therefore, we're very positive to variance, uh, positive to budget on a lot of those expense classifications. Uh, office supplies, a notable exception, uh, because that's one where uh, because we're stuck in the office and, and running these programs, we're burning up a lot of office supplies. Uh, to keep those programs running. And then the, then the other one on line T, liquidation shortfall, that is a phenomenon of, of, of uh, um, MBS style servicing, which is the, mo the bulk of our servicing. And uh, we did not anticipate payoffs being as high as they were last year. And with those payoffs comes liquidation shortfall. It's, it's a kind of a surprise because we, we didn't expect uh, the payoffs to be as high, but at the same time, uh, it makes sense given the fact that the payoffs were as high as they were. That's what I've got on the third quarter, uh, Mr. Chairman. And uh, was, again, this was informational and I'm happy to answer any questions. Uh, <clears throat> Jim, could I ask a couple of quick questions? Uh, what, what's uh, your book value of your securities and MBS? Uh, I don't have that handy. I can get it, I can get it for you. No, uh, no, it's, no. it's, it's not necessary. It's most not of it's in the debt service reserve in the, in the bond fund and, and it exceeds $100 million to 100, $120 million is the, just a, a round number of it. So it's a pretty big slug of, of, of investments. Most of them are six to seven year uh, maturities. And uh, so the, the increase in interest rates has, has really taken some of the value out of those. Right. But it, it's, it's still not as, as big a hit as I thought there might be on that. Uh, uh, because all of us in the 
financial wor world have taken a hit on those value of the securities. The, the second quick question is uh, pension. Uh, how is your 401k working out? And uh, what about acceptance from the employees? Uh, is that, is, is that uh, doing as well as we anticipated? I, I think the employee participation is, is, is really pretty good. Uh, and and uh, I don't have, again, specific, we, we have talked about it. Uh, we monitor it on a quarterly basis, make sure the investment options are, are you know, in sync with, with prudent uh, options made to be made available to our employees. And I've not heard anything negative uh, uh, from anybody on it. I think the part, the participation is pretty good. I know that the, the total value of assets uh, uh, under management, if you will, in the plans exceeds a million dollars already, uh, having started from zero. Uh, you know, the, the folks are, our folks are, are putting money into it. And how much did you say uh, we'd say by uh, there was some savings by going ahead and paying the state off on it, a uh, significant amount of savings, I think? Well, when we, when we uh, uh, estimated uh, how much it was going to cost to exit, my hard copy uh, calculation was about $86 million. And so in abundance of caution and conservatism, we booked 90. And then when the final bill came in, we, I think my estimate was within four or five hundred thousand dollars of what the of, of the eighty six million dollars was, which I had last year. And so when we actually only have to pay eighty six and change, and you would book ninety, then you have a write up, if you will. That write up is not re that write up is reflected in some of the statements, but not in the not in the budget versus actual statements, because that's an off budget uh, type act, uh, amount that goes through the financial statements. Uh, it was in the income statement that you saw. Uh, uh, earlier that I put on the pro forma, but it was not, it's not in the BBA uh, schedules themselves. So, uh, but anyway, and then, and then the running rate, the paying rate before was 49 cents on the dollar for every payroll dollar. We were paying 49 cents under the new plan. We're paying four cents. Uh, so we're saving 45, 45% of our, our annual pay our pay to our employees by not having to contribute it to the, to the fund across the street. So uh, okay. it's a much more progressive and, and, uh, 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 it's 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 much it, it, it helps us manage better, if you will, because we can be much more reactive in, in how we can compensate and with either hard dollars or or uh, a pension or retirement funds. Okay, thank you. An excellent report. I, any members have any questions of Jim in regard to this rep report? This financial update. <laughs> okay, so uh, Jim, I guess we go on to the adoption of the annual budget and approval of the budget expenditures. So you've got two resolutions, right? We need to talk yes, about. Yes, sir. We have two resolutions. One is to adopt and approve the operating budget or the annual budget uh, for the corporation. Uh, and that schedule is on page six. And I think we can go right there if you want, Jeremy. Uh, and then the other uh, action is to adopt the and approve the uh, budgeted operating expenditures. And that's on page seven. And so we'll have two, uh, two separate agenda items that were resolutions that need to be adopted uh, as part of as part of uh, this presentation, sir. Uh, go down, Jeremy, if you will, please. Uh, keep going, keep going. Okay, stop, 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 stop. Sorry, at the top of this page, uh, these are the members of the committee. I thank each and every one of them. Uh, it's the deputy executive directors of the corporation, uh, Winston Miller, obviously the ED, Tracy Thurston, who's the Senior Director of Financial Management, who's my uh, number two, and then Mike Bianco, who's our controller. Uh, he's, the, he's the guy that actually has to find all the numbers that go in the budget. So, and, and then he has to get everything that's in the budget on a spreadsheet into the ledger system so we can generate all the comparative statements uh, during the fiscal year 23. So uh, these folks have been instrumental, extremely important, extremely uh, helpful in generating uh, what goes into the budget. Now, a couple more pages, Jeremy, to the first for this first table of, of figures. A couple more, keep going, keep going. One more right after this, there we go. Uh, this is page six of the budget. This is the operate the annual budget for the housing revenue bond resolution. And it will be uh, the first resolution that we need to approve. Uh, the top part of this in the shaded uh, is the actual financial performance, if you will, of the uh, housing revenue bond trust. That's that that holds the loans and holds securities that are uh, in, invested with the bond proceeds. Uh, then it also is responsible for the debt service on the bonds. And so this is an income statement, very pro forma, 
Uh, it's the, you can see that on line E for the 2023 budget, we anticipate uh, net interest income, if you will, for no other, for because that's pretty much all that's in that in the uh, trust of four and a half million dollars, and they will pay three million dollars of it out to cover operating expenses in connection with the operating side of the corporation supporting the investment or trust side of the corporation depicted here. And so a net increase in cash flows of the HRB projected to be one and a half million dollars. Uh, that number this year is impacted by a couple of things. One is the trust is getting smaller as we continue to pay, pay off bonds and not uh, issue bonds. And number two, we have some variable rate bonds which are projected to uh, increase in interest rate uh, as the year progresses. Uh, already this year, they've gone from 20 basis points to 88 basis points. So every time you hear that the uh, uh, overnight funds rate by Fed are increasing, uh, then the interest interest rate on our variable rate bonds increases by about the same amount. And so uh, that is in the budget to uh, continue to go up a little bit. And it's uh, going to, you can see that the interest expense for, is projected next year of $6 million on line B is actually uh, higher than the 20, 2022 projected actual as the uh, increasing rates on those variable runs, bonds start uh, uh, eating into some of the profits of the trust. But uh, not again, not a surprise, but disappointing that that uh, uh, we'll have um, higher expense than we would have otherwise liked to have had. The second part of this is the operating fund and, and the revenues coming off the operating fund. You see this as part of the budget versus actual analysis. These are the different components that are in the budget. Uh, the overall on this is that uh, we're projecting about a $2.8 billion increase uh, in fees and administrative reimbursements. More than that amount is coming from uh, having the homeowner assistance fund line O uh, outstanding and operating for the full fiscal year, uh, whereas it had really only been launched uh, to the public uh, in February of this year. So uh, everything else is running, uh, everything's running at full speed, but uh, that one is running at a higher speed than it was last year because it's full speed for the full year and only partial for the last year. And so, uh, so we're you know, projecting that the legacy operations and, and, and the existing uh, high, high, high running rate uh, uh, COVID initiatives uh, will continue during the year and generating $47.6 million uh, versus the 44.8 of last year. Scroll down just a, just a tad, Jeremy, if you could please. Okay, here's the $3 million line O, or T, excuse me, is the 3 million contributed from the uh, bond trust total revenue into the operating accounts of $50 million. And we'll see on the next uh, page, the uh, operating budget of expenditures of 46 million for a surplus of $4.4 .4 million. Uh, I can remember days when KHC had big losses on that line deficits. Um, you can see that the projected actual for this year is $16 million. Let's remember that there's an extra 7 million coming in from the HRB supplementing that. And we'll talk about some of the other expenses uh, that, that we anticipate incurring in the, but in the fiscal 23 budget year that we have not incurred in the projected actuals of fiscal 22. So this is the first uh, resolution that's going, that's going to need to be adopted and it's considered the annual budget for the housing revenue bond trust. And we'll do that as, as soon as I finish the, the rest of the presentation, we'll, we'll knock out both resolutions uh, in succession. The second page of the resolution or the second resolution is the approval of this schedule, which is the budgeted expenditures of the housing revenue bond trust. It's kind of a misnomer. Most of these expenses, in fact, all of them are incurred outside of the trust. And in, in our infant years, the only expenses we incurred were expenses in support of the trust. Now we do all these federal programs, which we didn't do from day one, but the, the accounting for it has, has morphed. And now most of our operating type expenses are here, even though only $3 million of those are in support of the housing revenue bond trust. And so you can see that, that we anticipate spending uh, twenty five and a half million dollars in salaries and benefits on line C and another eleven eight in business services. Much of that is contract services and and uh, 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 temporary agency uh, services supplying us with folks to do all the things that we're doing. Uh, computer operations. Uh, again, you can't do it without the computers and the computers ain't cheap. and and uh, you know we are we are constantly uh, fending off uh, hack attempts and, and penetration. Uh, of, of outsiders into our systems. Uh, we are in the process of, of securing redundancy so that when the cable between here and Louisville is cut like it was the first three days of April, uh, that we can hit a switch and resume a business instead of being essentially dead in the water from here, but everybody working remote was able to continue to work. So we, we got 80% of the job done during those three days, but the redundancy of having a separate piece of fiber that would run 
And the one piece is runs directly from Frankfurt to Louisville. The other one might go through Chicago and Indianapolis, but at least uh, we'll have a second piece of, piece of fiber that we can tap. Uh, looking at line F for closures, uh, that number is significantly higher than the running rate for, for fiscal 22. That's a result of, we again anticipate coming out of foreclosure moratorium and in fact are coming out of foreclosure moratorium as we speak and that the losses attributable to then prosecuting the foreclosures uh, will be higher than they were in the last two years. And, and you can see that this is in decreasing order of, of dollar amount. Uh, I'd, I'd like, this, this is the expenditures that need to be approved in the resolution, 20,592,000. Now I wanna compare those to, to a reasonable benchmark by moving, moving us to uh, page uh, nine, I think, Jeremy. And the value of this comparison, keep going, bud. Uh, uh, yes, this one, this is good. Um, the value of this analysis is, let's take a year of actuals, which is the projected actual for 2022, and see how much less expensive or more expensive uh, our operation is going to be for next year and then account for why. And you can see on this, the top line is the, or the leftmost column is the budget for 2023. And it's, this for this analysis is being compared to the 2022 projected actual. The, the packet has the 22 budget in it, the packet has 21 budget in it, a number of different comparatives. Uh, we decided the projected actual is gonna be the most uh, comparative set of numbers that we can have uh, for purposes of the 23 budget versus uh, the, go the running rate of the corporation. You can see that, that uh, payroll salaries is going from 19 million uh, to 25,590. Uh, that's a reflection of, of a number of realizations. Um, it, it reflects significant headcount additions to properly staff all the COVID initiatives. We are swapping, if you will, uh, a temp, temp agency uh, pay for on payroll pay. And so when you look at Line D, we're dropping, uh, significantly dropping the cost of outside uh, contractors uh, by $1.4 million. That's not because we're, we're decreasing overall headcount to get the job done, uh, but it's we're actually increasing headcount, but it's on payroll, which is cheaper than paying uh, a temp agency plus the profit piece that's, that's embedded in, in paying for a temp uh, through an agency. And so some of that increase in salaries and benefits is attributable to that. Uh, we have realized that uh, we've been running a little too lean in a few departments. Uh, not all the work that should have been getting done was getting done. Uh, and uh, so we've anticipated hiring uh, several folks into two or three departments uh, to get us back up to uh, uh, adequate staffing to, to get 100% of the job done instead of potentially 87 or 88%. Uh, and then there's inflation out there. I think we've uh, read enough about it. Uh, it is a reality. And so we've tried to put a little bit in the, bu in the budget in anticipation of uh, inflation impacted uh, increases uh, in that line item. Um, going down the rest of the budget, uh, there's an awful lot of expenses that you can see are in the 200 to $250,000 uh, uh, more than last year. That is, that's a lot, uh, uh, you know, again, we've touched on it last year, fiscal 22, we thought the, the pandemic was over and we ended up not spending a lot of money in a lot of those cost, cost areas. Uh, we really think the pandemic is going to allow us to, to uh, have training offsite. Uh, some of the stuff that we put off deferred maintenance, if you will, on training and, and education of our staff. And we really, uh, so we've, we've bulked up the budget. Obviously, it's going to be more than we spent last year because we didn't do a lot of it because, again, we were, we were landlocked here and couldn't travel and, and, and couldn't get that training done. Uh, another uh, uh, number of some note is line N. You can see liquidation shortfall is actually much favorable. Uh, in the budget compared to projected actual, we really think payoffs are going to slow down. And, and a lot of payoffs in the last two years, year and a half, two years, were a result of very, very low interest rates and a ton of refinances. Uh, rates aren't do not make refinances uh, nearly as, as uh, uh, a good a deal anymore. Uh, if you read the Wall Street Journal the last two days, it's been full of articles about uh, major mortgage companies nationwide laying off thousands of people a lot of the mortgage companies are looking to actually merge and sell their companies because the the metric of how they were making their money is gone, and that's uh, they made more money on refi business than they did purchase business. Conversely, most of our business is purchase business. We don't think we're going to see a huge decrease in production this year versus last. Uh, but the the metric, the one thing on liquidation shortfall 
which is a function of payoffs in an MBS uh, servicing portfolio, we see the payoff activity dropping and therefore a little bit of a boost or a reduction, if you will, uh, in the uh, overall expense on that line item. And so all said and done, um, and, and the narrative that, that's in your packet has four or five pages of, of, of uh, some more in-depth uh, description of what's going on. Uh, the budget, you know, we're, we're being, we have to be careful. We have to have redundancy. We have to, uh, we are exploring, and I think somebody mentioned it earlier, uh, we're looking to go to the cloud for certain applications uh, just because you physically the the, the storage devices are, are you know they become untenable uh, there is some hard storage that we're also looking at uh, because we store images of documents and storing images of documents are now done on disk drives and 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 the like instead of monstrous file cabinets stuffed away in caves in Wilmore and so uh, you know we do have a, a good uh, destruction, you know, a, a, a ro rotating and, and uh, uh, destroy uh, practice and, and, and manage that, but we generate a ton more, a ton of records, all of which are imaged and have to be stored someplace. We have to have redundancy. Uh, we have several places where we are uh, heavily involved in succession planning. Uh, we're not all, none of us is getting younger. Some of us are really getting older. And uh, so we're looking at redundancy or excuse me, succession planning. And so uh, that's reflected in the budget so that there's no surprises at the end of the year when we've overspent someplace where we should have anticipated spending it uh, up front here. Personally, I would like to see a surplus of six to seven million dollars. Uh, we have, we're at four four. We're incurring a few extras this year. Uh, I think we've got a good budget, a sound budget, uh, one that we can live within uh, and maybe have a couple of favorable surprises between now and the end of the year on the revenue side. So um, with that, I'll open it up to some questions or any questions or what have you on, on where we are with, with the budget. I, it's, I you know, uh, uh, invite you to look at all the other schedules uh, that in support of, of this and, and ask any questions that may come to mind, you know, next month, next year, whatever. Um, and, and one item that I did wanna mention is that um, we are implementing a, a, a profitability analysis tool uh, for lack of a better term, it's, it's the, uh, negotiated indirect service uh, uh, charge uh, between us and the, and the government on, on grant and, and program administration, where we are allowed to identify an overhead factor, if you will, and charge that factor against the admin fees. Uh, it wasn't a big deal when we had a pension expense that gobbled up all of our admin fees, but now that we don't have that pension expense, uh, we we don't want to leave admin on the table. So we're, we're, we're making sure that we spend enough money uh, uh, in hardcore expenses in the in the operating units for training and, and getting the job done as best as we can on the administration side, but then also being able to top it off with some allocation of some overhead so that we can maximize the uh, 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 admin fee income into the corporation. Thank you, Jim, for an excellent uh, presentation. Uh, do any members have any questions of Jim? <clears throat> So if not, uh, we need a, a resolution, uh, a motion to adopt resolution 25. Uh, so do I have a motion to that effect? So move to Gail. Okay, thank you, Gail. Second? Second. So we have a motion and a second. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those like sign, motion carries. Uh, also, we need to have an adoption of resolution number 26. Uh, do I have a motion to that effect? I make a motion. Okay, we have a motion and a second. So moved, Gail. Okay, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Motion carries. Okay, so uh, Jim, you want to uh, talk about your uh, line of credit with Fifth Third Bank? Uh, yes, sir. And and uh, first of all, thank you everybody for for putting up with a, a 20 minute uh, diatribe on the budget. Uh, sometimes it gets a little dry and, and uh, uh, but I do appreciate uh, everybody's uh, uh, help in, in helping us in, in getting this, uh, getting the budget approved. Uh, Mr. Chairman, if I may, uh, I would like to talk about resolution uh, for the PNC line of credit first, because it, this, the, the, the agenda item has a much lengthier discussion. Uh, and then, then we can backdrop the fifth third. I apologize for these two being out of sequence, but I think it'll flow a little bit easier if we go to the Okay, the PNC one, which is the next uh, agenda item on there, Jeremy. Go right ahead. Thank you, sir. 
<clears throat> okay, this is an agenda item. Uh, to we have to renew our lines of credit every year. We have a sixty-five million dollar uh, unsecured line of credit with PNC Bank, and we have a twenty-five million dollar unsecured line of credit with Fifth Third Bank. Uh, they generally have the same purpose. Uh, the PNC Bank uh, warehouse line has additional uses uh, that that benefit us uh, in in many of our our financial transactions and arbitrage transactions that help us generate uh, a, a few extra dollars here and there uh, just by, by managing money and debt. Um, the, the line uh, allows the, it's, it's used for warehousing of mortgage loan, mortgage purchases uh, that'll be sold into the secondary market. That's the primary use of both of these lines. Um, we can also use this line uh, to purchase seriously defaulted FHA, VA, and RHS loans out of Ginny Mae pools. There's a huge arbitrage opportunity that's available using this technique. Uh, using it here, we estimate saves between $800,000 and a million dollars a year in, in interest expense uh, that we would other, we otherwise be paying to the security holders. This line also has a, 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 a sub-facility in it to allow us to have access to capital if we need it, should uh, defaults get so high that we have enough cash in the, in the, dis, in the disbursement funds to pay off security holders. This piece was put on the line uh, right at the outset of COVID uh, when, when we realized that with mortgage forbearance, uh, we were not going to cash flow in, but we still had to pay uh, huge amounts out to the security holders, whether we got it or not. This would have provided us with a, a line of credit uh, to, to have access to that cash so we would not default on our servicing. We have not had to use it. We don't have to save it for that use. Uh, so the full $65 million is available to us. Uh, something new this year, uh, LIBOR, as, you, as many of you will be aware, is uh, disappearing. Uh, and so the basis for both of these lines has been LIBOR. And so uh, this line is going to be uh, based on Bisbee, uh, which is the Bloomberg Short-Term Bank Yield Index. Uh, that's, an avail that's an index available on Bloomberg services. Uh, it's a little bit different than LIBOR. It's not a bunch of guys sitting around smoking cigars and deciding how much they were going to lend money to each other uh, over in London uh, in LIBOR. And so... Uh, <coughs> As part of the due diligence of looking at the at the, a possible new index, uh, we've got a three-year history of how Bisbee reacted uh, and, and what, how that index moved uh, and compared it to LIBOR. And what we found was Bisbee was was tracking maybe 18 to 19 basis points uh, less than LIBOR. Um, and uh, so what happens is the bank changes what it, what its what its margin is going to be. And in this case, we we agreed to one month Bisbee plus 40 basis points, and this line will contain a non-usage fee of 15 basis points if we don't borrow it, which is a double plus for us because not only is the index tracking below LIBOR, but uh, PNC is dropping their, their uh, 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 index or um, margin from 50 bips to 40 bips. So if we had had Bisbee last year, uh, our line of credit would have been run between 15 and 20 basis points less in rate uh, than it did while it was on LIBOR. And so uh, I think this is a win for us. Uh, Bisbee is new, uh, and, but uh, it's, a, it's a trackable index. It's a daily index. The line will be priced off of that. And if it performs the way LIBOR did, it actually resulted in a little bit lower interest rate than if LIBOR had hung around. So management recommends approval of, the facility, of renewing the facility at PNC Bank on the terms I've just generally outlined. Okay, so Jim, so we need to approve this line of credit with, with PNC Bank, and, and are both these lines of credit secured? No, both of them are unsecured. So we have to provide what we're using them for. We can't use them for operating purposes or working capital. They're, they have very specific uses, and we make sure that, that uh, the uses that we're allowed to use them for are the only uses that we borrow money for. But they are unsecured. We're not pledged, no collateral or anything's pledged against them. Okay. The reason I asked it on this notice fifth thirds uh, was uh, <clears throat> SOFA and uh, secured overnight financing rate. So I, I assumed you were securing it. No, so, so far is the basis for the index, but not necessarily the terms of our line. Okay. All right. Okay. So uh, we need a, a authorization to renew the line of credit with PNC oh. Bank. Uh, do I have a motion to that effect? So I'll make a motion. Okay. okay. We have a motion. Do we have a second? Second. Okay. We have a second. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed like sign. Motion carries. Okay. So, so Jim, you want to talk about fifth third? 
Yes, and again, thank everybody. I thank everybody for your patience on, on what has become a fairly long agenda today. Uh, the fifth third line, again, like is like I said, it was a $25 million line. We are going to base this one on SOFR. Uh, why are we using a different index? I'd like to see how they both act together uh, in the same uh, against each other. And so uh, uh, this one is actually uh, SOFR run, has been running on a comparative maybe uh, nine to 10 basis points uh, 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 under LIBOR. And so because it was under, then uh, uh, fifth third is, has, instead of raising the, uh, uh, gave us a little break by, they would, in, it would indicate that, that the uh, line should have a, 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 a um, I'm sorry, a margin of 100 basis points over SOFR and they're letting us have it for 95 basis points over SOFR. This line will generally, I think, uh, bear interest at maybe 25 to 30 BIPs, a higher interest rate than the PNC line, but we're gonna have them both running against each other and, and uh, if we need to use uh, the fifth third line, we'll use it, but most of the time we'll be over on the, on the PNC line. The fifth third line also has more limited uses, allowable uses. Uh, we can use it for normal warehousing and we can use it for the uh, default purchase arbitrage program, but we can't keep loans in that program for more than three years or two years under fifth third and, and PNC lets us keep the loans in there as long as we need them uh, to stay there before we can flip a loan out. So uh, it's a good deal. Uh, it's nice to have this type of access of financial access available to us. We have not been using the lines very much because we've been stockpiling cash uh, in anticipation of paying off the pension. Since we paid it off, we will be borrowing money uh, this year uh, much more uh, than we were borrowing uh, last year or the year before. So um, I think they're both good deals. Uh, this will give me the authority to negotiate uh, uh, the specific terms and conditions, most of which I've already seen, uh, and uh, recommend that we, uh, the board approve renewing the line of credit with Fifth Third Bank uh, for $25 million. Any members have any questions to Jim on this? And Jim, as always, we we certainly appreciate uh, your hard work and your effort. Uh, you do an excellent job uh, with these figures and uh, and and also explaining those to us. So, uh, if there are no questions to Jim, uh, I'll entertain a motion we adopt this uh, line of credit. I'll so move, Mr. George. Okay. And uh, do I have a second? Second. Okay. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Both like sign. Uh, Jeremy, I need for you to note that I abstain from voting uh, uh, due to a, a strong business relationship I have with Fifth Third Bank. All right. Uh, motion carries. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate it and I appreciate everybody's uh, time uh, and working through these uh, issues today. Thank you, Jim. We appreciate you so very much and, and your people. Uh, please give them our best, okay? Absolutely. All right, Jeremy, you're up. Uh, uh, adoption of the uh, uh, cycle three restatement. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, so as everyone is aware, uh, when we exited the CURS pension system last year, we were we were required to adopt and uh, have a defined contribution plan to replace that pen pension plan for our employees. Uh, the result of that was that we adopted a 401A plan, which is the uh, tax code section under which it qualifies. Um, as a condition of having that type of a plan, the tax code requires that on a six year uh, rotation that you restate that plan Obviously, we haven't had it for six years, but the six year rotation is based on the code and, and when those plans came into being and when this process came into being, not based on when your plan was adopted. Also, this is the cycle three restatement. And obviously, this would only be the first restatement of our plan, but the cycle three uh, regards the this is the third time since that process has been adopted that a six year restatement would be done. So essentially this is year 18 of that process. Uh, the purpose of this is, as everyone will be, should be aware and I'm sure is aware, um, the, the law in this area changes over time. Uh, statutes change, regulations change, court cases occur. And so on a six year basis, the IRS, even though those laws are perfectly applicable to your plan, once they are enacted and effective, uh, the IRS just wants you to restate your plan 
to reflect those changes on a six year uh, rotation. So this would be the first time we've done this for our plan. None of the changes are really substantive in terms of how the plan works, the benefit to our employees. Uh, it will not change any of those things. The employees would still um, have their contributions into the uh, 401k plan that we already had uh, matched up to 4% by KHC as the employer into the 401a plan. So it really doesn't affect their benefits at all. A lot of the changes are definitional. Um, as everyone is probably aware in the last six years, we've had a little change at the federal level as to the definition of marriage, for example. Uh, it's, it's things of that nature that are affected by this. So um, we just, uh, we ask and recommend that the, the board adopt the cycle three restatement, which is really prescribed by IRS statute and regulation as to what needs to change there. Uh, and uh, we'll be happy to answer any questions you may have as best I can. Any members have any questions of Jeremy? <laughs> Uh, so if, if not, I'll entertain a motion. I, I, have, I have one question is because uh, I understand IRS, you don't mess with them. Are all the changes connected to the IRS? Are any changes just ones that we decided to make? No, they're all prescribed by the IRS. Thank you. Uh, okay. And let's, if I would move if, unless there's other okay. questions. Thank you. We do have a motion. Uh, then to adopt this, do we have a second? I'll second it. Okay, we have a motion and a second. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Close like sign. Motion carries. Thank you, Jeremy. Thank you. And thank you for all you do uh, for KHC. So uh, <clears throat> we'll move on to uh, informational items. Uh, Winston, uh, I'm going to turn that over to you. I think you have a couple of things you want to talk about today. I do, um, and uh, thank everybody for their time today. And I know we're running a little long, but I would like to fit these informational items in. I think they're important for the board to have some information on and that sort of thing. The, the, we have two informational items. The first one, you'll see the title page uh, on the screen here. Uh, Jamie Rice, who's managing director for single family programs is going to uh, do a presentation on single family programs, increasing access to home ownership. Uh, and uh, following that, we'll, I'll, I'll introduce the next program. But go ahead, Jamie, thank you. Okay, thank you, Winston. Thank you, uh, members of the board, for the opportunity to speak to you to talk about single families' efforts to increase access to home ownership opportunities to first time home buyers in our state. I realize the meeting's going uh, long, and I'll be as, as concise as I'm able to, given the information I want to share with you today. To um, preface, let me uh, remind the board, if you are not already aware, KHC does not directly originate loans. We do not employ loan officers. And Jeremy, I think you're you're, you're fine staying there. I'm, I'm, I'll catch up to you. Uh, we don't employ loan officers that go into the markets to originate loan applications. Instead, we purchase loans from lending companies, mortgage companies, banks who originate, underwrite, close, and fund them. Uh, for a very small book of business, we may provide the underwriting function. But my point is, we do not, we're not directly in the markets. We support those who are directly in the markets. And also, let me highlight that this current market is not a friendly market for first time home buyers, especially for any home, home buyer who needs access to a friendlier mortgage product like FHA loans with down payment assistance, otherwise known as our specialty. I'll, I'll start with saying that the cost to build new homes is very high. The supply of existing homes is very low. Each new listing is receiving multiple offers, which drives up the sales price. Uh, recently, the president of Lexington Bluegrass Board of Realtors shared that the sales prices in their market since 2019 has increased by 40%. And on average, homes are selling for 102% of the list price. So a home listing for 100,000 today is selling for 102. And if the home doesn't appraise for that 102, then it's the home buyer that has to come up with that difference, that $2,000 difference. I'll say also, as you all know, Jim's mentioned it a few times, interest rates are increasing. 
sales contracts, and this is a little worrisome for us, for me personally, sales contracts that list government financing like FHA, VA, and RHS are being rejected outright. Sales contracts that list home inspection contingencies are likewise being passed over. Sellers are not offering closing cost assistance. On the flip side, home buyers are having to offer to pay the seller's closing costs to even be competitive with the other offers that are coming in. And inflation in general also makes it harder for lower income families and individuals to enter into this arena. Next slide, please. Uh, for years, KHC has tracked internally the percentage of our loans that were to minority home buyers. Our overall production, as well as our production to minority home buyers in particular, from calendar years 2006 through 2021, shows a steady increase the largest of which occurred from 2016 to 2018, which were the years that we had the HHF down payment assistance available in four counties of our state, including Jefferson County. That was the $10,000 forgivable second mortgage funded through U.S. Treasury's hardest hit fund program. Uh, and that ended, it was no longer eligible in Jefferson County at the end of 2018. It went away uh, for a period in 2019. So you can understandably see a, a decrease though that year after that program was no longer available in our largest, most diverse county, but we have since bounced back higher. Now, as a reminder, according to the American Community Survey in 2020, census data reports that the state of Kentucky as a whole is comprised of 86% white households, 8% black or African American households, 3% two or more races, and 3% Asian or other races. Uh, next slide, please, Jeremy. So speaking of Jefferson County, we went back the past four years specifically to see out of the overall statewide production, what does it look like in Jefferson County, since that is our highest populated and most diverse county in the state. The blue line is a reminder of the statewide figures from the previous slide. The orange line is our total production breakdown in Jefferson County alone, which is much higher as it should be. So last year in Jefferson County, 41% of the loans KHC purchased were for minority home buyers. This outpaces the fact that 30% of Louisville's population is non-white per the 2020 Census uh, American Community Survey. Next slide. So Kentucky Housing is actively working to increase access to home ownership to all low to moderate income Kentuckians. Home ownership remains the primary way that most Americans create generational wealth. One way that KHC is committed to increasing access to home ownership opportunities is through our support of housing education and counseling programs in the state. KHC is an intermediary for the HUD Comprehensive Counseling Grant. We also invest our own dollars each year to support the state's housing counseling network. Our state's counselors can accommodate clients with a variety of delivery methods. They are also required to have language access plans for their clients with limited English proficiency, usually through contracts with interpreter services or local colleges. Housing counselors can assist their clients with addressing barriers to housing through basic financial literacy, such as budget and credit, but also through rental counseling, fair housing, homeless services, pre-purchase homebuyer education, post-purchase non-default counseling, and post-purchase default counseling. This is a list of our partner counseling agencies that we work with across the state. They're all required to be nonprofit agencies. If they are doing any counseling associated with any HUD program, they are required to be a HUD certified counseling agency. Since 2013, KHC has administered nearly $2.3 million in the HUD housing counseling grant funds across the state. Since 2014, we have invested over $750,000 in the state's housing counseling network. Uh, between those funding sources, we support, we use those, our own dollars as leverage funding when we apply for the HUD grant. And between both of those funding sources, we support our subgrantee agencies in serving roughly 2,500 clients and households each year. I apologize that I've set my PowerPoint to a widescreen, Jeremy. I'm making you work hard here. I apologize for that. Um, housing counseling and education is an important tool to increasing access to home ownership opportunities, but we must acknowledge that access is not equal because not, ever, not everyone is starting off at the same pace. 
We have a history of systemic racial inequality in housing, finance, banking, education, healthcare, transportation, and employment, just to name a few. And each of these sectors impact the ability to purchase a home. We are very concerned with reports across the state and nation that FHA contracts are being rejected over cash offers. Most of these cash off offers are either investors or their parents cashing in the equity in their own homes to help their children enter the homeownership arena. Many minority first generational home buyers do not have the means to secure such gifts from family members as that means to build generational wealth has not yet been obtained. Another barrier to home ownership access is the drastic, again, the drastic increase in home prices these past few years, limited supply, rising interest rates, inflation. These circumstances make it hard for first time home buyers to compete in this market, but it hits minority first time home buyers harder, and I'll show you how. This is a dashboard, and I think you'll be able to see it a little better. Yes. This is a dashboard KHC has been working on for over a year. At some point, it may be public facing. I, I, I won't say that we are um, done with it yet. I know that you may not be able to see it very well. I'll explain some of the graphics. This data comes from the Census Reports American Community Survey of 2020. This tab presently covers Jefferson County specifically. And as a reminder, the state's racial composition as a whole, 86% white, 8% Black or African American, 3% two or more races, 3% other races. The first color bar that you see depicts the racial composition of the county. It shows that Jefferson County is comprised of 70% white households, 22% Black or African American, 3% two or more races, 3% Asian or other races. The second bar shows the racial composition of property owners in Jefferson County. It shows 83% white, 13% Black or African American, 2% two or more races, 2% Asian and other races. The third bar shows the rental composition for uh, the, the racial composition of renters in Jefferson County. 57% White, 35% Black or African American, 4% two or more races, 3% Asian, and the rest other races. At the very bottom of the page, which I know you're not able to see, it shows the median household incomes by race, and I'll, which relates directly to affordability. And I've broken it out on the next page, Jeremy, in a little easier way to see. What it says is that in Jefferson County as a whole, the median household income is 58,196. But if we look at it by the racial composition, it tells a, varying, a very different story. For white households in Jefferson County, the median household income is 64,693. For uh, Black or African American households in Jefferson County, the median household income is $38,325. But the disparity in household incomes is a huge challenge to increasing home ownership access to minorities, especially right now when home prices have surged 40% or more in the past three years. Sellers, again, receiving multiple offers on each listing and FHA loans are being rejected over cash offers or conventional financing. And then the next page is a a look at the ethnicity for Jefferson County. And we've got this for every county, but this, this again is our highest population in the state of Kentucky is in a single county. Uh, but for Jefferson County, it's 94% non-Hispanic versus 6% Hispanic or Latino. The home ownership composition is 97% uh, non-Hispanic versus 3% Hispanic or Latino. And then the rental composition, 89% uh, non-Hispanic versus 11% Latino. And then looking at the incomes on the following slide, based on ethnicity, they're a little bit closer than when you look at them by race, but they still show that race and ethnicity can predict buying power. Non-Hispanic Latino median household income in Jefferson County was 65,572 compared to Hispan Hispanic Latino median household income of $50,508. So given that background look at Jefferson County, how did KHC do last year? Remember, we partner with lenders. We do not have originators in the field taking loan, application, uh, loan applications. In Jefferson County last year, we purchased 757 mortgage loans. 41% of those were to diverse home buyers compared to the 17% diverse home ownership rate in Jefferson County. 18% of the loans KHC purchased across the state were to my, uh, diverse home buyers compared to a 7% uh, 
diverse homeownership rate in the state. This tells me that our lenders are doing an amazing job with their marketing and outreach efforts, and they are taking advantage of our programs like down payment assistance. It also tells me that our own marketing, outreach, and education efforts to our state's mortgage lenders, housing counselors, and real estate partners are also making an impact. Another thing that we, um, next slide, Jeremy, <clears throat> please. Another thing that we recently put in place is our interactive lender scorecard. We are reporting on the number of loans that our lenders do for home buyers who are at or below 80% area median income, as well as how many loans our lenders are providing for minority home buyers as it relates to their pipeline, as well as KHC's total loan volume. This will help us by knowing which of the companies that we work with have penetrated the market so that we can offer further support to their efforts. Lenders are required to look at their and look at and report their quote unquote scorecards from investors to other investors. So this is a tool they can access at any time they need for their respective companies. We do this because our mission is to invest. Next slide, please. Our mission is to invest in quality housing solutions, again, for all families and communities across Kentucky. We envision all Kentucky families and individuals living in quality housing they can afford. And I apologize for that slide. Uh, next screen, please, Jeremy. Something else that we've implemented is our Lender Liaison Committee focused on increasing homeownership access to minority home buyers. We first met in October of 2021 with another meeting in December. In 2022, we've gotten sidelined a little bit. Number one, we came into January, Omicron was just crazy. And then we uh, launched our Homeowner Assistance Fund program in February. And we'll, we're still working through that program's initial demand. We do plan to meet later this summer or early fall to continue those discussions with this group of lending partners on how KHC can support the efforts of our lenders across the state to increase access to homeownership opportunities to a group of people who historically were systematically denied equal access to banking, finance, and home purchases in the past, and as our data supports, they are still behind compared to our white population in the state. For the lender committee, as a group, we discussed the need to diversify our industry and the need to be consistent presences in our classrooms and communities, and we need to keep pushing forward. Our committee meetings have involved heavy discussions on racial bias and appraisals. We heard the story of a lady in Indiana who had to remove all essence of her race and, and had a friend's white husband stand in for her as her brother for a third appraisal on her home when the first two seemed to be lower than they should have. And then the value of that third appraisal compared to the first two was just tremendous. We also discussed how Kentucky's appraisers are predominantly older white males. They also have a lot of control of who enters the industry because they have to sponsor new appraisers for the first 2000 hours. And often what happens is they would only uh, sponsor their own family members. So that made it harder for new blood to enter into that field. The um, Kentucky Board of Appraisers was in the process of implementing measures to make it easier for new blood to enter into that field. They were working on it late last year. I believe it is in um, it's in place now. We are sponsoring an upcoming panel discussion with members of Mortgage Bankers Association on appraisal bias and race. This panel consists of some of our committee members and the former speaker from Central Indiana's Fair Housing Center. So even though we've not formally met as a group, we are still working with com the committee members on various endeavors. And I think that is my presentation. Do we have any questions? Uh, yeah. yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you very, very much. Um, Kathy, you have a question? Uh, yeah, I have um, two. One is when Laurent was there, I was on that committee. Mm -hmm. I would love to be on that committee. I heard those presentations. Yeah, they were. They, and we we haven't met since, but we, we're still working with, you know, they're out. And the, the goal was always our lender committees we've had many times, many years. I've been at KHC for 20 years. We've had them. This one is focused on our DEI efforts in lending. The goal is always for not KHC to tell the lenders what we think they should be doing. It's always been for us to listen to the lenders who are in the field and for them to tell us what they need. And there we have a great relationship with our lending partners. And it's a two-way street uh, as far as, you know, they ask us for what they want. 
and need. If we're able to do it, we do it. If we're not able to do it, we explain why. And, and you know, but we do listen to them. Okay. And my second is, um, uh, the 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 numbers are great, okay, uh, but um, you compare uh, uh, who you lend to to all Jefferson County, but don't we only serve low and moderate income people? And what percent of low and moderate are the minorities? So when you use a whole all the population of Jefferson County, median means as many people above as below. And a lot of those people are going to be, we see by the numbers, white. So the 41% should be compared to who our cons potential consumers are. And that's all I, I, I'm, I'm, that's, I like, I like the numbers. I'm just saying it should be, are we, you know, and I'm, I bet we are serving more, uh, uh, but we, we, you know, in all, in honest data, we should compare to what our potential consumers are, uh, how many are minority. That that would be the only thing. And I think what you would find is we're doing great. Mm -hmm. I think, Kathy, when we started the project, uh, we started it from the point of view of how, what are we doing? How how are we doing? And, and we can't just look at our numbers without comparing who's out there to be served. And that's where we've started diving into the the census data. And I'm not an actuary. I, I'm just a mortgage person, you know, so I, I know how to get loans in the books and, and analyze data a little bit. Uh, but my degree was not in statistics. So that's where I, I rely on others. But again, the dashboard is a work in progress and it may take varying turns as we look at it. But it, it started from the point of view that we needed to we needed to we needed to give ourselves a scorecard and we can't adequate adequately judge where we are without looking at who's there to be served. We have any and other my questions? Point was, was that that's our con potential consumers, not the whole of the right. world. Yeah, that, but thanks. Any other questions of Jamie? Jamie, thank you for your excellent report. Uh, we really do appreciate it. I know it took uh, some time to put this together for us, particularly with all the other demands that you have upon you at this particular point in time. Thank you. Uh, the, the next report that we have is from Wendy Smith, uh, who is the director of uh, housing programs, deputy executive director uh, on homeless programs update. Wendy? Yeah, I will try to keep this as succinct as possible. Um, that's almost an impossible task when you're talking about addressing homelessness across 118 counties, which is what KHC does. But I will um, sail through this. And then if at another board meeting, uh, you all want more, we'll go into more detail, or if someone wants to just have a conversation with me, I'm happy to do that too. So just to orient you all, we kind of have three big buckets of program areas. We serve home buyers and homeowners. We do a lot with rental housing and rent assistance. And then we have um, a lot of work that we do around homelessness programs. Next slide, please. So we have what's called the balance of state continuum of care which is the homelessness response system for 118 counties. Uh, next slide, that might be helpful actually. Um, one more slide, Jeremy, and then I'll make you go back, sorry. There are three continuum of care or continua of care in Kentucky. Lexington Fayette County is one, Louisville Jefferson County is one, and then the rest of the state is one. There are advantages to this, but as you all can imagine, addressing homelessness in an urban county is much more different and focused than when you're trying to do it across 118 counties. That includes mid-sized cities, small cities, and just really rural counties. Um, there are kind of uh, five key things I want you all to know about addressing homelessness in Kentucky. And really these are national trends, many of them mandated by HUD. Um, one is the formation of these continuum of care entities in states. This was mandated by HUD quite some time ago. Every state has um, one to uh, umpteen continuum of care entities that address homelessness. Um, there's another um, element called coordinated entry, which means uh, you don't just do first come first serve, you take a need and triage approach. I'll talk about that in a sec. Housing first is mandated by HUD, meaning um, the solution to homelessness is getting folks housed. 
That is the focus, to first get them housed and then address other related issues. And then we take a, uh, we use our funding to, to support a range of interventions that I'll share with you all in a sec. And then we do a lot of um, data collection and reporting to try to demonstrate system performance. That is mandated by HUD. So our balance of state continuum of care, again, is 118 of Kentucky's 120 counties. It's really, it, it has a kind of a couple of identities. It's a governing body. There's an advisory board. It's a planning body that lays out um, how, what the policies are for the continuum of care, how uh, coordinated entry and other efforts are going to be done. They vote on efforts. So they really kind of are, um, they're an advisory committee that makes some decisions for the state continuum of care. And it's made up of um, homelessness providers that get HUD funding and some who don't. We have some that are faith-based and do not wish to get HUD dollars, but still participate with the continuum of care. And we also have other partners like community mental health providers, community action agencies that, you know, they end up working with people experiencing homelessness and they, they participate with the continuum of care. Our goal um, writ large is to create a homelessness response system that ensures homelessness is rare, brief, and non-recurring. There will always be folks experiencing homelessness. We would just like it to not happen often, be very, very brief, and not happen again. That is that is our long-term goal. So this is just an org chart to give you a sense of the structure. There's the Kentucky Balance of State Continuum of Care Advisory Board. KHC staff support that board. We are not members of that board. So we do not vote on the policies. We do advise and support them. We do staff a lot of the administrative work that happens on behalf of the continuum of care. And then there are agencies that are members of the continuum of care um, that um, participate in the programs, get funding through it and all that kind of stuff. So our role as an agency is to be the planning agency and staff to the continuum of care advisory board. We also put together what's called the collaborative application to HUD every year. These are not guaranteed funds that come through the continuum of care through HUD. They are competitive. So every year we compete and we put together an application with 25 other agencies in the state where we roll all of our, our asks, some of them for planning across the whole continuum of care, some of them for individual shelters or individual service agencies. And we have to roll it into one giant application. It's a Herculean effort every year but we've competed well every year and gotten um, slightly more money every year for the last five years, which is great. We, that's what we want is our organizations to have enough funding. We are the um, Homeless Management Information System Administrator, meaning we collect the data, report on the data, and we do that for the entire state. And then we also administer coordinated entry. I'll talk about that in just a sec. Next slide, please. Coordinated entry is this idea that we're no longer taking a first come first serve approach to serving folks. Um, we now have policies that the continuum of care establishes about how do we triage who has the most acute need and who should get what housing solution. So who gets rent assistance, who gets shelter, who gets ongoing supportive services. Um, and so this is our agencies, along with our staff, setting policies and prioritizing the need and the solution to the homeless individual or household. Um, so it's, it's kind of like an ER waiting room where just because you walked in with a cold doesn't mean you get seen first at the ER. It's going to be the most acute cases first. Housing first, again, also mandated by HUD, is saying that we have to remove programmatic barriers to getting folks housed. It's rooted in the idea that folks need a place to live stably in order to address other stability issues like substance um, abuse, like getting a job. So uh, housing first is the idea that you don't create a whole lot of barriers that keep people from being able to get housed. And um, it's also the idea that shelter is not an end to homelessness. Getting someone in a homeless shelter does not solve their homelessness. They are technically still homeless. So it's, it's housing that solves for homelessness. Housing first turns out to be cheaper than having people go into shelters, go into incarceration, go to ERs. That is all very burdensome on our criminal justice system, on our, I can tell you in my small town, the local police are the folks that end up interfacing with homeless folks in my county. And 
that they're not trained to do it and it's not really you know what, what their job was was shaped to be. Um, it, it turns out to be cheaper to get folks housed, even though that can feel um, a little illogical or counterintuitive. In the end, we really need more just affordable units so that we can get folks housed or people can find housing without our help, ideally. And we also need permanent supportive housing so that people who are going to have a hard time staying housed without ongoing services, folks with severe mental illness, for example, they really are going to need supportive services along with their housing so they can stay housed and not return to homelessness. Okay, so here are the things we fund with the dollars that come into KHC, um, the, the, the ways that we address homelessness. We do fund homelessness prevention. We fund eviction diversion. We fund street outreach, uh, meaning you know, folks going out and, and interfa interfacing with folks who are living on the street. We fund supportive services for people experiencing homelessness. Emergency shelter, which is often what many of us think of first when it comes to homeless response. We do fund emergency shelter, but less and less. More of our funding is now going into rapid rehousing and rent assistance, again, with that idea of housing first. So don't have folks spend a long time in an emergency shelter, get them out of that shelter and into housing as quickly as possible. And then of course, we also, through many of our other programs, we create or, uh, or renovate permanent affordable housing and permanent supportive housing. So those units that we need. And then I won't spend a lot of time on this, but we do a lot of data management and reporting and performance um, evaluation for HUD across our homeless um, services. Next slide, please. So I wanna make sure you all don't leave this, um, this presentation without knowing what do you do if you, if someone in your community is homeless and you're trying to get them connected to a solution. And what I wanna encourage you to do, and we've got um, contact stuff and we can get you this, this PowerPoint. You wanna contact the local prioritization agency or the community lead that does coordinated entry for your region. Next slide. The regions for coordinated entry are based on the area development districts. So this is a map. Many of you might be familiar with the ad districts. And so the next slide has a list of who the, who the personal contact is and their email for each of our local prioritization lead agencies. So each one of these aligns with one of the area development districts. And this is who is kind of in charge of intake for coordinated entry to get a person or a family on the list to figure out what kind of help they ought to get and what partner in the region ought to work with that. Um, you can of course contact me or my staff, but your best bet is getting to that local person in the ad district. And then I, I will just end by sharing a couple of things with you all about how we are trying to seize the opportunity of our one-time COVID response dollars to address some long-standing delivery system gaps um, for our housing programs and for homelessness. Um, Jeremy, I'm not going to go through all of these, but we'll touch on a few of them so we won't have to see it all the way through. I recognize it's, it's getting late. So just to recap for you all, we have some ongoing programs that we get year over year and we compete for or we get by formula allocation from HUD. We get continuum of care dollars, we get emergency solutions grants, and we get home dollars, some of which we use for tenant-based rental assistance. However, we've got this magnificent opportunity through some of the one-time COVID dollars to to add a lot more funding to the solutions that we need. We got emergency solutions grant CARES dollars. We got emergency housing vouchers into our Section 8 program. We got a, a one-time gigantic increase in home funds through the American Rescue Plan Act. And we have emergency rental assistance from Treasury. So we have really tried to, to use these dollars. And this is a table most board members have seen many times just to give you a sense of the magnitude. It's, it's a significant amount of one-time money Next slide, please. And here are a couple of things we're doing to try to address delivery system gaps. First, and we're really proud of this, for the first time ever, we have homeless response programs for rapid rehousing to get people housed, you know, housing first, and to do street outreach. We have that across the entire state. We have never before the last couple of years had coverage of these services across the entire state. And it's because we got more emergency solutions grant funds through the CARES Act that allowed us to ask our existing partners to add staff, to add geography. Um, I know Mike Denham called me a year or so ago about an issue in Maysville. And before this, this money, I would not have had a 
a partner to put Mike in contact with. But we do have a partner that works, you know, all the way, they go from, from Northern Kentucky to Maysville in their service area. They did not use to. Um, our aim then is to, this money will expire. Uh, we think it will actually run out around March of next year. It doesn't expire till later, but our aim is to use our emergency rental assistance $2.0 dollars to pick up and keep funding those organizations to do the, to keep doing that work. So we're trying to strategically piece this one-time money together to keep that expanded staff and geography going. Next slide, please. Um, we also used our emergency rental assistance dollars to recently create an eviction diversion program in the courts. We're currently in Campbell County, it's a pilot, and we are supporting um, in Jefferson County because we added Jefferson County to healthy at home eviction relief. We are now um, on their Zoom court docket so that we can fast track um, rental assistance applications to help folks get caught up on their arrears and get a landlord paid so that they don't lose their housing. Or if the landlord won't participate, we give some assistance directly to the tenant so they can get rehoused. Again, this is a pilot, but we've never before been able to try to do something where we work in the courts to try to prevent evictions or help people have relocation benefits to be able to get rehoused. Um, we also are using some of our one-time money to build an online platform to recruit landlords and connect landlords that are willing to take rent assistance to the tenants who are looking. As you all know, we have a shortage so what we want to do is at least for landlords who are willing to participate, let's get them connected to a tenant who is searching. That might seem like a big dub, but we've never had enough money to build and staff because really it takes some customer service. We are in the process of calling hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of landlords to ask them if we, will, we can list their units in our platform. We're excited about this and our hope is that it will get a lot more folks housed more quickly if a landlord knows they've got rent assistance through KHC. Next slide, please. Um, we're also aiming to use our ERA2 funds from Treasury to fund legal services for at-risk tenants for multiple years. We're um, negotiating with Treasury right now to try to keep all of our funds so that this can be a three-year program where across the entire state, um, folks can get within 24 hours a callback to get legal advice and to sometimes get representation in eviction court so that they can stay housed. Next slide, please. Um, we're using some of our ERA funds to help tenants who get to the top of a waiting list with a public housing authority um, that they can get help with their initial lease up costs. So really just a few thousand dollars max to pay their upfront deposit, to pay their utilities, um, to um, pay any old debt that's keeping them from being able to get you know, utility startup or any of that kind of thing. What we're finding with our own tenants and other public housing authorities is if you get lucky enough to get to the top of a waiting list, then if you don't have enough cash to lease up, HUD does not help you with that part. So you might take out a personal loan or credit card debt to get leased up. And we would like to help folks avoid that. Next slide, please. And I'll, I, will, I will stop with this. Well, I already talked about the eviction diversion program. Next slide, please. This is a duplicate. You can go to the next slide, Jeremy. Okay, the last one is we are in the process of establishing a team of in-the-field housing connectors or navigators because even though we have tenants that are getting a, a, you know, rent assistance, them getting their paperwork done, finding a unit, negotiating with the landlord, it's just proving a real challenge. So we are in the process of recruiting these connectors to help people who have rent assistance, find the unit, talk to the landlord, get the paperwork in and get housed quickly. Um, it's just, it's a delivery system gap we've never been able to find. And then the last one is just that we are using our home ARP funds to fund, and this is in partnership with um, our section eight program, our homelessness programs and Jeremy's multifamily programs to use some of that funding to create permanent supportive housing for people experiencing homelessness who need those intensive services to stay housed. Um, and we're really excited about that. And I think I have one last slide here. We are doing this supportive housing institute with those funds where we have six development teams, three from Louisville, three from the rest of the state. And it's 
the property management company, a developer, and a nonprofit that are meeting over five months intensively to plan a permanent supported housing project. This is being led by a national expert, Corporation for Supported Housing, and our teams are getting training and technical assistance and um, to shape a really strong project because getting these built isn't the hard part. It's keeping them running successfully over time when you're serving folks who are often the hardest to serve and the hardest to keep housed. So I will stop there. I think um, everything else in the PDF is just links to information for you all if you want more information or you want to know about programs that we have. Um, so that was real fast. I'm happy to give anybody more detail one-on-one -on -one or in, a, in another meeting. Thank you, Wendy, very, very much. Great program. And again, if, as she said, if you want more detail on any of these items, please contact her or identify the subjects that you think need more, you need more information on and we'll get it to you. Are there any questions uh, for, for, for Wendy on her presentation? Uh, Winston, I'd just like to compliment Wendy and, and Wendy ask you to, to uh, uh, send us a, a, say, uh, to the pri a slide presentation, if you if you don't mind. Absolutely. Uh, I'm going to leave that to Jeremy since he's got everybody's email address and all that good stuff. Okay. All right. Thank you so much. We'll get that done. And before I relinquish the floor, uh, Mike, let me uh, say a special thanks to all the people from the Kentucky Housing Corporation that have appeared before you today, each carrying an, their own unique uh, responsibilities and burden. Sam Thor uh, Thorner, John Davidson, Wendy Smith, Jim Statler, Jeremy Ratliff, Amy Rice, and, and Kevin Fields. Uh, and each of those people represent only the a part of what it takes to get the job done. And depending upon what the order of the presentation was, there are literally tens or twenties or thirties of people uh, working to support their effort to get the work done that they present to you. And then I also like to make a special thanks to you and to the other board members for your time and being here today and being supportive of our efforts. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Winston. And, uh, uh, thank you, Wendy and Jamie. We appreciate your effort. And uh, Winston, before we we leave this, uh, would uh, have you? Uh, can you tell us a little bit about maybe what's going on in West Kentucky as far as tornado relief? Just just a real short sentence or two. Uh, well, a uh, short sentence or two. Um, uh, things are 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 proceeding. Uh, there's been a seventy five million dollars of um, community block grant uh, funding uh, that is uh, associated with disaster relief that has been identified uh, by the federal government. Uh, and uh, the, the responsibility for spending those funds uh, falls in, in terms of planning on how to spend those funds starts with the Department of Local Government. And there are statutory procedures which uh, they must uh, comply with uh, in order to be able to utilize those funds and statutory limitations on how those funds can be can be utilized. And all of that process is is in in the in the work, so to speak. Um, in the background, uh, we've got uh, FEMA still there supplying housing to the people that qualify for FEMA housing. Uh, the state of Kentucky has purchased a number of additional mobile uh, units, uh, housing units, mobile homes, trailers, whatever, uh, that have been placed on in state parks uh, around the state. There's still a few people that are being uh, housed in uh, the, uh, the state parks uh, and uh, hotel facilities that are still being covered under FEMA rehousing uh, uh, situation. Um, you know, there. There's a, a lot of people doing a lot of things uh, down there uh, attempting to mitigate the situation. Uh, we know that a lot of people are still living with relatives, living with friends. And uh, the unfortunate thing about it is you can't wave a magic wand and recreate the housing that existed uh, before this disaster. It takes time. And uh, uh, there's a lot of good people that are uh, deeply involved in trying to make that happen. Uh, 
I hope I'm happy to answer any questions I can uh, for that. The, the, um, the responsibility for all this uh, effort is uh, rest not only with FEMA, with Kentucky Emergency Management, and, and, and at least 10 different state cabinets uh, that are involved in different aspects of uh, attempting to attend to the needs of the citizens of Western Thank you, Winston. And we, we really appreciate the fact that you all uh, have had a team on the ground, I know, uh, since that early that Saturday morning. Uh, so uh, our hats go off to, to your, your people and, and, and your staff for doing that. And uh, Wendy, I know you were over at the Kentucky Emergency Management System early that day. So, so thank you all for, for your efforts there. Uh, the, <clears throat> uh, any of the members have any questions for uh, Winston or uh, Wendy or Jamie? Uh, <clears throat> well, if not, uh, just let me, Winston, if you would give uh, the board's best to all of your employees and for the hard work that they do and for the impact that they have on, on Kentucky, uh, we certainly appreciate it. Absolutely. And I want to wish uh, all of you all a, uh, a nice Memorial Day weekend and uh, <clears throat> remember our honored dead. So uh, if with that, uh, I guess we're ready to adjourn. Is that right, Winston, or do you have anything else? Uh, I have nothing else here. Okay. Mr. All Chairman, right. I know it's been a long meeting, but I, I do want to uh, mention one thing real quick. Okay. Uh, for several years, we've had a lady named Tracy Butler. And for those of you who have had the opportunity to attend a meeting in person, uh, you will have met her. Uh, I'm sorry for those who uh, who have only been able to join us remotely that they have not been able to meet her in person. But uh, Tracy, for several years, has served as our board liaison. And I will say that when I became general counsel, you may have varying opinions of how well these meetings go and are ran, but I can promise you they would be far worse had Tracy Butler not been around to help me out and, and kind of teach me the ropes and train me on it. Um, but uh, Tracy notified us last year that this would be the last year she would be uh, able to help us in that regard. Uh, so we've been training Sarah Gibson, who you all have been interacting with via email at least uh, for the last year. Uh, but this will be the last meeting that Tracy will have covered by her contract. And so I just want to mention Tracy. She's been a huge asset to us for several years now and uh it, it would be a shame if, if we let this meeting pass without mentioning her and thanking her for her service thanks jeremy, to tracy the jeremy would you be sure and recognize her in our in the minutes please i will um and unfortunately i don't think she's in the meeting anymore but uh i i did want to mention her we, we appreciate her hard work and her effort uh, she has been really good to deal with and, I, and she's been uh, very helpful to me uh, the last few months. So I appreciate that. So any other members want to make any comments in, in that regard? Okay, any, if, does anybody have anything else before we go? All right, if not, we'll stay in adjourn. Thank you all very much. Rec